Right guys, welcome to this introduction to statistical testing. This is the first of three videos that all together are going to cover everything that you need to know about statistical testing for A-level psychology. You can see the content of all three videos on the screen now. So if you are happy with the content of section one, which is this video, you are more than welcome to go on to section two or section three. The links to both of those will be appearing on your screen now, one after the other. So go ahead and just click on those if you feel like that's what you want to do. However, the plan for this video specifically is to just lay the foundations a little bit for what statistical tests are and why we use them. We're going to cover a couple of key concepts like null and alternate hypotheses, probability and significance, calculated and critical values, and also probably most importantly, we are going to look at how to actually establish significance using an example. Bear in mind, this is potentially going to be for you a new topic. There's going to be a lot of keywords and a lot of key phrases. However, just bear with it. And by the time you get to the end of video three, all of this will come together and it will all make sense. So to help us, we're going to use a little experiment. And this experiment is going to follow us through all three videos. So my experiment is all about investigating the impact of CBT on depression. And I've got a very simple hypothesis. There will be a difference in 25 participants' depression scores on the BDI before and after a six-week course of CBT. For some reason, I chose to do a non-directional hypothesis. It could probably have been a directional one, but it doesn't really matter for our video. So strictly speaking, that isn't going to be the only hypothesis that I use, because actually every study has two types of hypotheses. You have the original or the alternate hypothesis, which is H1, which states that there will be an effect. And that is the hypothesis that you just saw. So there will be a difference in participants' depression scores on the BDI before and after a six-week course of CBT. That is the hypothesis as you know it, that is a hypothesis as you have learnt it up until now. There is also, however, the null hypothesis, and this is the second hypothesis that every researcher has for their piece of research. And the null hypothesis states that there will not be an effect. So effectively, it looks like this. There will be no difference in participants' depression scores on the BDI before and after a six-week course of CBT it effectively says that I'm not going to find anything. This is important because a statistical test allows us to decide which of these hypotheses is true, and ultimately whether we accept or whether we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so it all comes down to the null hypothesis. Do we accept it or do we reject it? And if it turns out that we reject the null hypothesis, then effectively what we're saying is that my study is good and my statistical test has told me that my results are good. And we'll go into that as we progress through the video. Okay, so that's your first little bit of key information that you just need to understand. Simply because when you write about this in an exam, you will be expected to write things like, the results are significant and therefore we can reject the null hypothesis. So, moving on, to say which of the hypotheses is true is, strictly speaking, not right. We're actually looking for significance rather than truth. Let's assume for a minute that we find a difference in depression scores before and after CBT. And it turns out everybody improved. It turned out that CBT is a great therapy for people with depression. Now, just because I found an improvement in depression scores after a six-week course of CBT doesn't mean that my results are valuable. It doesn't mean that they're significant. It doesn't mean that I found anything useful at all, because those results could quite easily have been down to chance or fluke or coincidence. So we need a statistical test to tell me whether or not my results are significant. We need a statistical test to tell me whether my results are because of something that I did or whether my results are down to chance. So in order to do that, studies employ what's known as a significance level in order to check for significant differences or relationships in a study. 
and the generally accepted level of significance or level of probability is 0.05. And that is the level at which the alternate hypothesis is accepted or the null hypothesis is rejected. Now what 0.05 means is that there is a less than 5% probability that the results occurred by chance. So if you flip that on its head, I'm saying that if my results come back as significant after conducting a statistical test, then there is a 95% probability that the results occurred because I did something. They occurred because I manipulated the IV, because I set my study up well, whatever you want to call it. Now, 0.05 doesn't always have to be the level of probability. Some studies have a much smaller one. You've got P equals 0.01 or even 0.001. It always depends on what the researchers are trying to achieve. But as a general rule, you will be given the significance level, so you will always know what level of significance you are working at. And if you don't get told it, then it's always 0.05, no matter what. Okay? Sometimes it changes, though. Now, just to put that... 0.05 into a bit of a different example just to kind of make it absolutely clear. Imagine you're pregnant, boys do your best, and you take 100 pregnancy tests. And then after you've taken 100 pregnancy tests, five or less are showing as negative. That means 95 of your 100 pregnancy tests show that you are pregnant. That means that you can be 95% certain that you are pregnant. And that 5%, that's an acceptable margin for error. Everyone is going to turn around and say, yeah, you're pregnant. That is effectively what P equals 0.05 means. Now, significance levels are quite important. And it is possible for researchers to choose the wrong significance level, which can have a negative impact on their research. Obviously, researchers in their work they have free range to choose whichever significance level they want. But if they choose the wrong one, it can lead to one of two errors. If your significance level is too lenient, okay, so if it's too big, and if researchers decide to go for a 10% significance level instead of a 5% significance level, so that would be 0.1 instead of 0.05, then that could result in rejecting the null hypothesis when they shouldn't have. Okay, so that's a false positive. It's called a type one error. Okay, which means that we reject the null hypothesis when we should actually have accepted it. Okay, it means that your statistical test has told you that your results are significant when they're actually not. And also it can swing the other way. So if your significance levels are too small, so too stringent, and you go for a 1% instead of a 5%, which would be a 0.01 as opposed to a 0.05, that can result in a type 2 error, which is a false negative. That results in accepting a null hypothesis when we should have, in fact, accepted the alternate hypothesis. Okay, so our statistical test is telling us that our results are insignificant, even though they actually are significant. Okay, now this is important for you because it can come up in an exam for you to actually be asked what is meant by a type 1 error, what is meant by a type 2 error, or is it possible that the researchers made a type 1 or a type 2 error? Explain your answers. Okay, so again, just two key words and two kind of key concepts that can come about through um, issues with significance. Now, as a final part of the video, you need to be able to work out whether or not a set of results are significant or not. And this is probably the most important part of this video because it comes up pretty much every single year in an exam. And it can come up for anywhere between two and four or five marks. And they are easy marks, provided you know what to do. Now, in order to establish whether results are significant or not, you need to be able to read a critical values table like the one on the right. And this is a table that will be given to you in the exam. You don't need to remember it or anything. It will be there for you to use. In order to read the table, you're going to need several pieces of information. First off, you're going to need the n value. Okay, The n value is 
the number of participants that you have in a study. You're going to need the calculated value. Now, the calculated value comes from your statistical test. It will nine times out of 10 be given to you, and it will be determined by the letter S or the letter M, T, U. It depends on the test. There are about nine different tests that you need to know, and each of them will come with a different letter for the calculated value. You're also going to need to know your significance level. Now remember, the significance level is always 0.05 unless you've been told otherwise. And you need to know whether the test is one-tailed or two-tailed. Now that isn't anything complicated. All that means is, have I used a directional or a non-directional hypothesis? A directional hypothesis means a one-tailed test. A non-directional hypothesis means a two-tailed test. And then finally, you need the critical value. And the critical value is the value that you will pluck out of the table on the right. And I'll show you how in a minute. Now, just to reiterate, most of this information will be given to you. The only bits of information that you might not have are the calculated value, if you need to work it out for yourself, but that only ever happens in one scenario, and you'll learn about that later. The significance level might not explicitly be given to you, but if it isn't, then it's 0.05, and that's it. Okay, so there might be a little bit of detective work needed, but as a general rule, everything will be there. Now, let's have a little look at an example to see how this would work. So we'll use our experiment from earlier. We've got 25 participants, so we go to the 25 in the n value. We're using a non-directional hypothesis, so that means that we have a two-tailed test. We are using p equals 0.05 because I haven't specified anything different. So now we know which column we're in. And then now we know that our critical value is 7. Okay, So that's literally as easy as it is. Now, the other bit of information that we have because we worked it out is s equals 3. Okay, so our calculated value is 3. You don't know why it's 3 yet, but by the time you get to video 3, you will know. And so my question now is, are my results significant? Well, you're missing one piece of critical information, and that is this. The calculated value of s must be equal to or less than the critical value in order to be significant. Now, you don't need to remember that. That will be given to you in every single question that's like this. You will have a sentence that tells you when your S value is significant or not. Okay, so in this case, the calculated value of S equals 3 has to be equal to or less than the critical value of 7. It is, and therefore, my results are significant. And that is how you establish significance. Okay, and I'm just going to back that up with a couple of exam questions just so that you can see what this will actually look like in an exam. So I'm going to draw your attention to the one on the left. As you can see, you have a critical values table. Okay, not as detailed and not as big as the one that I just showed you, but it doesn't really matter. You can see you've got your n value on the left. You can see you've got your significance levels across the top. They've been kind in this one, so they've only given you the significance levels for a two-tailed test. That's fine. You don't need to worry about that. And you've got your 0.05 in the center column there. Okay. Now, I want to draw your attention to this. Like I said, you will be given this information, and there's the proof. Significance is shown if the calculated value of S is equal to or less than the critical value. Okay, and then you have your question down the bottom, explain whether or not there was a significant difference in the improvement in the scores. Okay. Um, and then you've got just a, a couple of other typical questions. Um, so you've got on the right, what is meant by a type 2 error, and explain why psychologists normally use a 5% level. And that is simply because it's a nice middle ground between um, a too lenient and a too stringent significance level. So... That's a nice simple question there. Type 2 error is a false negative. So just explain what that means. Um, explain why statistical testing is used. It's used to establish whether or not we need to accept or reject the null hypothesis and to find out whether results are significant. 
and then what is meant by results are significant at the p equals 0 0.05 level. That means that we are saying that there is a less than 5% probability that my results occurred by chance. Or flip it on its head, there is a 95% probability that the results occurred because of the manipulation of the IV. Now, that was a fairly long video and there are a lot of new pieces of information in there. I appreciate it's going to be quite a lot to take in. However, once you get through videos two and three, which are a little bit shorter, all of this will come together and it will all make sense. So thank you very much for listening. The link to video two should be up on your screen now. So go ahead and click that when you are ready to do so. I hope it's all made sense and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.